Hello, and welcome to another edition of Montgomery Talk, the podcast of Montgomery County Issues produced by Montgomery Community Media. I'm Doug Tolman, senior reporter at MCM, coming to you from our podcast studios in Rockville. This podcast is a little different than what we've done in previous editions. Our guest is Jennifer Alvaro, who has about 25 years of working with sex offenders for a number of organizations. We invited her to talk because we were looking for another point of view on the incident involving the junior varsity football team at Damascus High School. She made a number of statements about Montgomery County Public Schools that, in an abundance of fairness, we asked the school system for a response. They provided a relatively short response, which I'll read at the break. But first, here's our talk with Ms. Alvaro. Let's get started. Um, the primary focus in asking you in today was to discuss um, the, um, the incident at uh, Damascus High School, which obviously shocked, I think, not only uh, you know, the, the, that community there, but probably shocked every adult and kid, actually, um, in the county. And is there, I guess, first off, um, what are your thoughts on, on the incident? I think the incident was foreseeable, and I think to a large extent the incident could have been prevented. Um, foreseeable why? I think that Montgomery County Public Schools have created an atmosphere where they are reactive instead of proactive to larger issues in society and to current issues in the schools. I think that they have a history of not tackling issues head on. I think that hazing is a much larger issue across the country. It's nothing new on a high school or a college level. I think when you have a intense culture of achievement and success in sports or academics that these issues it's not a matter of if they're going to happen, it's when. And I think that if they had addressed that head on, there's good programs and information already out. It's nothing that needed to be reinvented or created, that this there should have been a lot more effort up front before any of these things happened. And that could have potentially prevented this from happening. Now, um, you used a phrase that was used at the very beginning, but a lot of school officials have rejected, and that is that there was a hazing incident. I think uh, some parents objected to that, saying yes. that you know, this was this sexual was, abuse. This was sexual abuse. Yes, it was. And not hazing. Yes, um, I agree. Okay. All I right. totally agree. I use the term hazing in the sense, and thank you for catching that. It's a critical one. This was not, this should have been phrased from the very beginning for what it was, which was sexual assault. Its roots lie in the beginning with, with I hesitate to use this term, good old-fashioned hazing. Some bullying, some rituals, some a culture, a mentality of bringing new or younger vulnerable people up to snuff. That's that's good old-fashioned hazing that has been around for as long as any of us can remember. If those things had been prevented, snuffed out, and certainly a culture created where the expectation is, if it does happen even despite all the education awareness, then the consequences would be swift and severe. The sexual assault probably never would have happened. That there is no, absolutely no way this all started with one incident of sexual assault. There was an existing culture prior to that where basic hazing, for lack of a better term, was was allowed. Um, just to, and to take a step back, would you say that there's adequate adult supervision of just in, in the school system in general and in sports teams in general? Or do you think this is exactly the example of the school system needs to take, has to do more to protect these kids? I think the school system needs to do more to protect our kids. Absolutely. How do you go about doing that? Education, awareness, policies, procedures, and, and most critically, enforcement of those things. Montgomery County Public Schools has a lot of policies and procedures, but very few of them regarding sexual abuse, sexual harassment, sexual assaults are fully implemented, Are have fidelity to what was originally set up, and consequences are often lacking. Okay. We don't have a, a member of public schools here to defend the, the school system, but I, the, what I do know is in the last, well, maybe it's been the last five years, they've implemented new policies in terms of um, even volunteers need to be vetted before they are around kids, teachers need to be vetted before they are allowed to be in a classroom. That vetting includes criminal background checks, et cetera. At least that's what we're hearing. I mean, what are you, what are you hearing? 
I will say this. In 2012, I went to MCPS schools. I graduated from an MCPS school. My kids are in MCPS schools. I have nine nieces and nephews in MCPS schools. Nine. Yeah, a lot. I stumbled across in news reports uh, several teachers who had been arrested for sexually assaulting children in schools. I did a quick Google search, and much to my horror and shame as a, as a, as a professional in the child abuse field, and I've taught prevention classes on a national and local level for 20 years, I had never checked MCPS's own policies. I found a policy that was 25 years out of date, found no information about background checks, no information about prevention, no information for parents, no information, none. Naively, I made just made a phone call. They must have it. I thought, they must have it. It must be somewhere. In this day and age, it has to be somewhere. Couldn't find anything. Got shuffled from office to office, basically patted on the head. I wrote a letter to the superintendent. Where is this stuff? I found eight arrests just in public, a quick Google search, eight arrests. Where's Where is this stuff? If you don't have it, I can help. I'm happy to help. I'll volunteer to help. No response. Well, to date, I could give you a list of over 50 50 teachers who have been arrested for sexually abusing children. But more alarmingly than that, because any large youth-serving organization will have adults who prey on children. That's a fact. More alarming that they had all those arrests is that time after time after time after time, and I can give you concrete examples, there is no one here from MCPS to defend them. Anything I'm about to say, I can give you concrete concrete proof from police reports, state opinions, documentations from meetings, public information requests I've requested. I can back up every single thing I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. Many people left in the classroom with clear knowledge of the school system that they were abusing children. Written documents, stop touching kids, stop doing lunch bunch, stop having the children take their shirts off, stop having kids sit on your lap. For years, continuing to abuse children. Hoover, Hoover Middle School had an employee peeping on the kids in the locker room, the girls changing. The girls saw saw him. They reported it. They pulled the video. They saw him. He admitted it. Arrested. Convicted. Lo and behold, several months later, he's rearrested for sexually assaulting his dog and peeping on the neighbor's children. Guess what? He's still an MCPS employee at the time. They had just transferred him to another department. So MCPS subsequently, because of my advocacy and quite frankly, because I started talking to the media, which is never, ever, ever a position I ever wanted to be in or expected to be in, never. Because of the media coverage, they started a child abuse work group. And because of that work group, they did update their 25-year-old policy. Because of my recommendations, they did implement new staff training. They were giving me documents in these meetings of current policies that directed their employees to commit crimes. There are federal laws since the 1970s about reporting suspicions of child abuse. And yet in their own policies, they were telling people not to report, to tell HR, to tell someone else. We have documentations of testimonies cloverly with John Vigna, who was sexually abusing kids for well over a decade. The principal testified in open court that no, she never called Child Protective Services. She reported to HR. So have they updated their policies, procedures, and regulations? Have they implemented new things? Yes, they have. And that's excellent. And that should not be overlooked. And they should get credit for that. But they still have a very long way to go. You just mentioned background checks. Montgomery County Public Schools only recently started checking people's Child Protective Services background checks. In fact, five G's. Six years ago, seven years ago, seven years ago, I, I told Montgomery County Public Schools, plus it's not just me, it's a national standard to check Child Protective Services. To date, they still haven't done that on all their employees. They're still rolling that out. That is outrageous and negligent. Child Protective Services has an extensive database of people who have abused children who do not have a criminal background. Even more egregiously, the overwhelming majority of Montgomery County Public Teachers come from out of state or out of Montgomery County. There is no national database for Child Protective Services background information. You can do a federal criminal check. You cannot do a federal Child Protective Services check. And so if I am living in Arlington, Virginia and commute over to Bethesda to teach in a Bethesda school, 20 minute drive, that's nothing. They have no idea if I have a CPS background because they don't check Virginia records. They only check Maryland records. And so even when they finish doing all their Child Protective Services, 
service checks, they still won't have the information they need. Montgomery County Public Schools will tell you they check NASDAQ, which is a national database of teachers who have lost the certifications. Last year, the state stopped checking it for a couple months. They didn't tell MCPS. That's not MCPS's fault. But during the time that they weren't checking, MCPS hired, I believe Derek Turner said in a statement, that they hired about 1,000 people. They didn't check anyone's references, although in their policy, they say they do. They didn't do it. And he was quoted as saying they didn't do it because they were really busy because they hired a lot of people all at once. Well, who fell right through the massive crack they intentionally left open? A man whose license had been revoked for sexually abusing a student in Florida. So do they have new policies and procedures in place? Yes, they do. Should they be commended for that? Yes, they should be. They're light years ahead of where they were seven years ago, but they still have a very long way to go. With that, I think we should take a, a quick break, but we'll come right back almost to where you just left off. This is uh, Montgomery Talk. I'm Doug Tolman, senior reporter at uh, Montgomery Community Media, and I'm speaking with Jennifer Alvaro, who has spent 25 years with in the sexual abuse arena, both as a, as a licensed clinical social worker and as a, a consultant for the Catholic Church, the school systems, the, the state, and whatnot. And we'll be back very shortly. Thank you. MCM, your community media center, is making Montgomery County a great place to live through programs like 21 This Week. Montgomery County's hardest hitting political talk show keeps you up to date with the local political scene. Montgomery Community Media, our middle name is Community. That was part one of our conversation with Jennifer Alvaro. Because of several of the things she said, we asked Montgomery County Public Schools if they wanted to respond. We offered them a rebuttal or even a separate podcast to tell their side of a few of the things Ms. Alvaro said. We received this reply, quote, we thank the state's attorney's office, the Montgomery County Police Department, Child Welfare Services, Ms. Alvaro, and the thousands of community members who have helped us develop and implement one of the most robust, if not the most robust, child protection policy, protocol, and procedures in a public school district. We continue to enhance and expand our work to ensure all students are safe and can learn and thrive in our schools. With regards to the Damascus High School incident, we can't provide any additional comment beyond what has already been shared as there is an ongoing law enforcement investigation. However, we encourage community members to avoid speculating on what they believe happened and allow for law enforcement to complete their investigation, end quote. The message came from Boyende Anajala, an MCPS spokeswoman. The message also included links to MCPS web pages and a Board of Education discussion on its child abuse policy. Those links will appear with the podcast, which you can find by going to our website, mymcmedia.org, and searching for Alvaro. Now back to our podcast. And we're back with M Montgomery Talk. I'm Doug Tolman, senior reporter with Montgomery Community Media, and I'm speaking with Jennifer Alvaro about child sex abuse, particularly about as it relates to Montgomery Public Schools. I wanted to piggyback. Uh, one of the things, I want to get back to the Damascus um, incident real quick. We started talking about that, and four boys have been indicted on this, and assuming that they are found guilty in their trials, what kind of punishment makes sense for these kids? That's a tough question to answer answer because the research, well, I should say this, there's many different forms of punishment, punishment, uh, legal consequences, punishment with, you know, education wise, where they're in school, punishment in terms of their ability to, you know, engage in further activities, outside activities, athletics. There, There's a lot of very good research we have on kids who commit sexual offenses. Some kids act out sexually for, for, for reasons, for a whole wide variety of reasons. The good news is is the research we have on kids who commit sexual acts towards other children is good focused treatment by experts in the field is highly effective. So that's the good news. I wouldn't classify treatment as a punishment, but many people would. So whatever their sentence may be, I would wholeheartedly wish and hope that a piece of that is that they get expert treatment for juveniles who have acted out sexually towards others. That's that's a major piece of this whole situation. There, I, my understanding 
understanding is, and I have no personal knowledge of the incident, that they're being tried in juvenile courts, which, you know, historically the, the thrust there has been rehabilitation, not solely punishment. So certainly there should be consequences because there's lifelong consequences for the victims and the bystanders as well, bystanders as well. But what those consequences are, I think, will hinge in large part to each individual's role in the events that occurred. The last we heard was that they had been moved to adult court. They were anticipating that their lawyers would petition to move them back into I juvenile see. court. But that was before the holiday. And I see. Been well, my recommendations would still, I work with convicted adult sex offenders, mm-hmm. and uh, the over many of them have treatment as a condition of uh, release. So, and that's that's very important. Sex, um, I should say this, if I may. Sexual abuse is never an accident. Sexual violence, sexual abuse, sexual harassment, it's never an accident. Never. It's a choice people make. People choose to sexually abuse, harass, molest, or assault others. That's um, alarming and hard to wrap your head around for someone who would never do it. But that the good news is then that it means they can learn to choose not to do it because it's within their control. And that's when education, prevention, and treatment becomes critical. So, and more generally, and not necessarily to focus on these four kids, abusers in general, we often hear are, were themselves abused. Does the data bear that out, A? And B, if it does, should we be looking at who abused an abuser and kind of go back the generations we need to find the causes? Right. So that's a very complex question. I'm going to grossly oversimplify the answer. I'm happy to provide resources or more information as you or your listeners would like. I'm going to start by saying the research is overwhelmingly clear that most people that were abused as children, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, exposure to domestic violence, most people who were abused as children don't ever hurt a child. Many of them wind up hurting themselves through substance abuse, promiscuity, poor hygiene, poor relationships, depression. Most don't ever hurt a child. So specifically in talking about people who commit sexual offenses against others, there was old research. This is the part I'm grossly oversimplifying. There was old research that basically went in and asked convicted sex offenders. And please keep in mind, only about 6% of offenders are ever caught and only about 3% are ever convicted of a crime. So the research we have is based on probably only about 3% of the people who actually commit crimes, sexual crimes. They went in and asked a group of sex offenders, how many of you were abused as children? And a large percentage of them raised their hands. Yes, I was. So somebody later, and that's where that misleading data comes from, that that most sex offenders were abused as children. They went back and redid that research and they asked the same question. And then about the same percentage said, yes, I was. And then they said, okay, we're going to polygraph you on your answer. They didn't but they told them they were. And uh, a fraction of the people said they had been abused. So the thinking there was that people were using it as an excuse. Now, in, in my professional experience, I've had offenders, um, about 30% in that study, about 30% it said, well, yeah, okay, I wasn't actually, I just said that. But in my experience, I've worked with convicted offenders who were horrifically abused as children, horrifically. And when I pointed that out to them eventually in treatment, they got furious and said, don't you ever say that I was not abused. So they flat out denied it even though it was horrific, sadistic abuse. So I think the number probably were somewhere in between. So no, not everyone who abuses someone was abused as a child. Some of them were. If they were, the first business of treatment is to make sure they stop hurting other people and uh, then work on the underlying trauma that may have led them to make those choices. But no, most most people, as far as we know, but again, remember this is a limited sample pool because most offenders are never caught. And of those caught, most about only about half are convicted. And it's only the people who are convicted who go into treatment. So it's a limited sample pool. Mm, I hope that answers your question. It's It's a complex topic. Right. And it's an interesting answer because I think the the converse has been so ingrained in um, popular culture, if nothing Mm -hmm. else, that um, whether you're talking about, you know, Silence of the Lambs or whatever, it just seems as though that that this is a, um, a given, not necessarily something that has a more complex answer. Yeah. So so as I said, I mean, with kids, we do see kids who are called what the current term is like sexually reactive, kids who have witnessed abuse or been abused and they're reacting off of that. Again, the, the treatment with children is very, very, very promising. And that's great news. To tie in on one other piece of your original question, in the in the field of sexual abuse for years, all we did was go tell adults about abuse. Or we only went and told kids, hey, if you feel uncomfortable, good touch, bad touch. That was That's a horrible thing to do to children. That would be like going out and 
telling children if the school catches on fire, stop, stop, and roll. But having no extinguishers, having no 911, having no firefighters, having no sprinklers. But that's what we used to do. That's crazy. That's wrong. Now we know, common sense um, and hindsight, that prevention of child sexual abuse, harassment, hazing, all these things are an adult's responsibility. It's our responsibility as adults to prevent most abuse. And we can. That's the good news that gets lost in all of this. Overwhelmingly, and research bears out, most abuse can be prevented. So now we know the place to start is with adults, just like we do with fire safety. And then we do have to educate kids about what this is. So God forbid we don't prevent it. They know and they can report. But the missing piece here, although there's more emerging research on this, it's like with bullying, right? We say, hey, if you get bullied, this is what you can do. We tell kids, if you see someone being bullied, this is what you need to do. So the bystander intervention. But bullying, they get it because they also say, hey, don't you be a bully. Don't you be a bully. (laughs) So they cover the whole realm. We don't do that as much as we should with sexual abuse prevention. We now, we educate adults, hey, this is what, this is what abuse is. We tell kids, hey, if you, if you, if this is happening to you, good, bad, uncomfortable touching, it should always talk about uncomfortable. Most abuse is not a one-time incident. It's a long, slow, gradual building process. So we have to talk about uncomfortable. But what we don't say is, hey, don't you do this to other kids. And we need to, we need to, because lots of kids, you know, we're starting to with consent, but, but a big problem here is that systems, including Montgomery County Public Schools, which is very frustrating, treat sexual harassment in isolation over here, child sexual abuse in isolation over there, hazing, quote unquote, over here, and never the three shall meet. And that's a massive mistake because it's all on a continuum. Sitting here waiting for you to start this interview, I rechecked Montgomery County's online page for sexual harassment definitions. It says online right now, what is sexual harassment? A relationships between staff and students is prohibited. If this is happening, students should report to school. No, no, that's illegal. It's a crime. There is no cross-reference between the child abuse policies and the sexual harassment policies. I have been pointing this out since 2012. It's ludicrous. It's absurd. It's negligent. So we have to make connections between all these things. We can prevent most abuse. We really can. And for what we can't prevent, we can stop it sooner and get the victim's help and make sure the offender doesn't have any more victims. And that's my whole goal with this, and that's why I'm grateful to be here. So talk to the parents of, uh, of, of a student in Montgomery County Public Schools right now and say, what do they need to know to protect their kid? Parents need to know that child sexual abuse is horrifically common and occurs with great frequency. Anywhere from one out of every three girls, one out of every five or six boys, at very least every one out of every 10 children will be sexually abused before they turn 18. If parents are listening to this thinking, oh, that's so sad, but it would never happen to me because I look like this or I live here or my kids are in this school, you're dead wrong and you're leaving your loved ones in danger. It's impossible that every single person listening does not know someone who was abused. It's literally impossible. People need to wake up and realize this is a real and present issue. People need to wake up and uh, hope that even if their kids are never abused, that somebody their kids knows is being abused or will be. And so education, 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 education is the key. Educating ourselves about signs, about symptoms, educating our children about what to expect. We talk, people are like, I can't talk to my kid about this. I say, why not? Your kids, you tell your kids horrible, god-awful things every single day. Put a helmet on when you ride your bike. Why? You could fall off and crack your head open. Put your seatbelt on. Why? We could crash. You could fly through the windshield. We had a code red drill today. Why? A man could come in and kill you all. We tell our kids horrible things. They're not afraid to ride their bikes. They're not afraid to get in the car. They're not afraid to get in the school. Every parent listening to this from infancy by naming body parts correctly all the way up to when kids are in college, just like school shooting, just like car safety, just like everything else. Sexual abuse is a big problem some kids might have. And even if you never have it, somebody you know will. This is what you need to know on age appropriate levels. One out of every 10 kids, a federal study said one out of every 10 kids will be abused by a school employee before they turn 18. Abuse is committed nine times out of ten by somebody the kid knows, likes, loves, or maybe even lives with. This is not strange. Do strangers occasionally abuse a kid? Yes. Ninety nine times out of ten, it's somebody the kid knows, likes, loves, or lives with, which means what? Parents need to be very aware that the first person an offender comes in contact with is not the child. It's the adults because they need the adults to trust them, to think they're a good, kind, safe person, so you will leave your children alone with them. Mm-hmm. 
Parents need to be very vigilant. Parents need to talk and talk and talk and ask hard questions. Parents should be aware of the school's policies, and when they see they are not being enforced, parents should go in there with their flaming swords of justice and demand that they be followed closely and make reports when they are not. That is the only reason Montgomery County Schools, the Catholic Church, the Boy Scouts have made changes to protect our kids. By and large, the most important thing is most abuse is preventable. This is not hopeless. There's a couple excellent programs that parents, I highly recommend anybody take. One one of the largest being run in the country, evidence-informed, is uh, Darkness to Light, the Stewards of Children program. It's excellent. You can take it free online in Spanish or English, and it's offered free a lot out in the community. And they have further modules about how to talk to kids about abuse, how to talk to kids about healthy touching. We don't want kids afraid to be touched. Kids need to be touched in appropriate, safe ways. So there's a lot of education out there, and I encourage all your viewers to get some more information. We're almost out of time, but I have one more question I wanted to ask. Yeah. You said earlier that you've got nine nieces and nephews in the school system. You have your own kids in the school yeah. system. Sorry, I'm making a face. It's six. I have six in this school system. I have a lot of nieces and nephews and a great nephew, too. So right. it's, <laughs> gotcha. it's six. I caught myself six in the Montgomery you County have, Schools. You have yeah. quite a, yes. a, a brood of, yes. r- of... Well, there's a whole pack of us out there. <laughs> ...that are in the Montgomery County Schools. Yeah. You've been very critical of Montgomery County Schools. Why keep them there? Because it's a good school system. You know, I had a very high-placed Montgomery County official say to me in a meeting once, you know, Jennifer, if the schools are so awful, you could put your kids in private school. I just thought that was so horrifying. And I said back to her, you know, person's name, I could do that. I have the ability and the means. But you know what? I'd rather make you do your job and keep our kids safe. I'm not pulling my kids out. I'm going to fight from within. I can protect my kids. How does that leave kids whose parents are unaware of these issues safe? That's offensive and wrong. This is not rocket science. It's pretty easy if they had somebody who knew what they were doing. They need to protect, follow the law and protect all children, not just have me protect my own. With that, I think we'll end it on that note. I want to thank Jennifer Alvaro for being with us today. Thank you. She has an extensive website at jenniferalvaro.com. Jennifer, like you expect, A-L-V-A-R-O dot C-O-M. It's got links that parents may find useful on how to protect their kids in uh, in, in these kinds of situations, these hor- horrific situations. I'm Doug Tallman, senior reporter at Montgomery Community Media, and our engineer today has been uh, Mike Valentine. We hope to see you next time on Montgomery. Talk. Thank you.